My name is Ray Dorsey. I'm a neurologist at the University of Rochester and the director for the Center for Health and Technology at the University of Rochester. I'm delighted today to welcome our second guest to Chet Talks, Dr. Ernesto Ramirez. Dr. Ramirez is a data scientist at Evidation Health. He completed his PhD in public health at the University of California, San Diego, and has authored influential studies on the effects of sedentary behavior and screen time for kids. In one recent study, he and his colleagues concluded, quote, having clear rules, setting limits on screen time, and not having screen-based media in the bedroom were associated with fewer hours of screen time for adolescents. Good advice for all of us parent, parents in the setting of the pandemic. Today, he's going to discuss the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on physical activity of over 150,000 Americans. Ernesto, welcome to Chet Talks. Thanks for having me. Thanks for also bringing me back to my PhD days. I think that was my first, first author publication that I did during my PhD program. Definitely bringing back memories of long days and hours spent in the library getting that manuscript done. <laughs> uh, thanks for joining us. So you're joining us from Los Angeles. Uh, before we discuss your study on how COVID affects uh, 150,000 Americans, can you tell us a little bit about how COVID's affecting you and your community in Los Angeles? Sure. So, you know, I was actually just looking um, up at the LA Times uh, this morning, and it's it's pretty pretty impactful right now. You know, we're under stay-at-home order. Um, the county uh, public health um, uh, agency is, is now basically saying that this is the week to stay at home at almost at all costs. If, if you can skip going out, if you can skip your grocery shopping, this is the week to do it. Um, personally, I know we've, my family, we, we're trying to just get through it with two working adults and a two-year-old toddler at home. Um, we live uh, pretty close to the beach and, and that's also been closed down to a lot of people's chagrin, um, both the beach and the beach path. So, you know, a lot of people just walking around on the sidewalk in the neighborhoods trying to get their activity in their vitamin D when they can. No surfers in Los Angeles? Uh, not, uh, not as of yet, not anymore. Not when they're um, got boat, police boats out there giving people fines. <laughs> I bet they're out at 5 a.m. <laughs> maybe, maybe. I'm, I'm not seeing them then. And uh, how's that COVID-19 affecting the work that you guys are doing at Evidation Health? Oh, that's a great question. So, you know, we focus primarily on digitally enabled research studies uh, where a lot of those are remote first. Um, so in terms of the research studies that we're conducting and the work that we're doing, it's not been a huge, uh, a huge effect that we're seeing. And we have the, the capabilities of, of moving our office to remote as well. So we had, I think about 35 employees out of our 180, 190 so far employees um, that were fully remote already. I was remote in Los Angeles, my office is in Santa Barbara. Um, and so I think we're, we had a, a decent culture that could support that work. And you know, I think things are humming along and we've actually got a lot of excitement. People are really engaged to take what we know how to do and apply it to um, the COVID-19 pandemic and see how we can help you know, researchers, how we can help the health system understand what's going on. Great, we're gonna get to that in just a second. Uh, not all of our listeners are uh, familiar with Evidation Health. Can, we, can you tell us a little bit about Evidation Health and uh, how it started? Yeah, so Evidation Health, uh, we, we think of it as a new kind of health and measurement company. It started with the idea that there is a wealth of data out there that exists outside of the normal clinical setting, especially outside of the normal clinical trial setting, where you have these very brief episodic measures. And with the advent of consumer and medical technologies that provide sensing capabilities and objective data collection, as well as just the kind of the digital revolution through smartphones and tablets, there's the ability to connect with patients to understand what's actually going on in their everyday lives. And so that's what we do. We, we bring uh, that information, those data to bear on interesting problems. Um, for uh, biopharmaceutical companies, for healthcare systems, um, for academic and clinical and government funded research. And typically those, all of those projects across kind of that broad swath of our partners can fit into really two categories, you know, the category of real world evidence and then personalized health programs. And I can talk a little bit more about those if that's of interest. 
Yeah, so uh, at least three programs have caught my eye. One, you did a study looking at wearable sensors showing that individuals with chronic pain walk 25% less than individuals without chronic pain. Mm -hmm. Another study uh, evaluating weight loss after bariatric surgery, and I think looking at activity after bariatric surgery, which is surgery for obesity. And then you did a uh, high profile study with one of your colleagues, Nikki Marinesk uh, and Eli Lilly and Apple, in which you used commercially available sensors, including an Apple smartphone, a bed, uh, a bed sensor, and a smartphone app, and identified digital fingerprints of cognitive impairment. Do you want to talk about any of those? Yeah, I can talk about all of those because they really span kind of a really wide swath of, of what, our, what our capabilities are and how we think this data can be useful in everyday life and for clinical research in, in the healthcare system. So, you know, the, I think a good place to start is, is in the weight loss study because it really shows how, why this data could be impactful. So what we, we did is we, we have a, a large virtual cohort called Achievement. It's a consumer application. People can join it um, for US-based adults, connect, connect their uh, Fitbit devices, their Apple Watches, health apps, and then they are incentivized to answer surveys and, and participate in different research studies. Uh, we asked those people, did you go through any type of medical event? And the, the answers we get back are, are very wide, and we just kind of funnel it down to some surgical events, and then specifically weight loss surgery events, and tried to look at what happens with those individuals that go through weight loss surgery uh, in terms of the objective data that we can capture from their connected wearable sensors. So we, we brought that down to basically a small core of about 100 individuals that had very dense, so like they wore their Fitbit device every single day almost um, for the 12 weeks preceding their surgical event to the 12 weeks afterwards. And we were able to see that using this continuous high density data, that there were drastic changes in not only behavior, such as physical activity and sleep, but also physiology, like resting heart rate and the time spent in higher heart rates. Um, for individuals. And this, it sometimes it feels like a, oh yeah, of course that's what you'd see. People, you know, they walk less right after surgery than they tend to walk more, or they sleep a little bit more after surgery than they get back to their baseline, um, or their resting heart rate falls as they get more fit and lose weight. But this is actually a completely different paradigm than in clinical trials to do that type of high density that you can see a change a day, a two days, three days after a surgical event. Typically, those individuals are only going to see the doctor, going to see their specialist, you know, at six weeks after post-surgery, and then another three months later, maybe another six or seven months later. And to be able to say, well, here's someone that has a good change, and then maybe potentially in the future, track people and, and be able to compare them in terms of their recovery trajectory, that can be very powerful. We think of this, I mean, it's a very first step. Uh, towards that, but I think it's it's kind of our way of illuminating the path that we think research should be taking in the future. Yeah, so if you think about the way we see patients in clinic or when clinics are open, we see them for less than 0.1% of the time mm -hmm. lives. Now we can see how people function in their real world settings, uh, consistent with the FDA guidance on the need for real world data, and you can get objective, sensitive, frequent assessments of people's health in a natural environment. Exactly. And, and that's a good kind of segue into the, the Lilly and Apple study that we did um, in, term, in terms of looking at how those types of data, those type of commercial sensors can be useful for mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease. You know, typically you're going to go into a clinic, you have a specialist visit, it's going to last however long it lasts, an hour, if you're lucky, a little bit over an hour. And you're going to have very rigorous assessments. And they're, they're, they're super useful. Like it's really useful to get you know, a scan of your brain. It's super useful to go through the actual clinical interview that, that we know is, is valid and can, can put you on a scale. Um, however, it could be really useful if there were devices that could collect data and that data could be used to understand where you fit along that scale, along the pathway of potential mild cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease without having to go see a physician. Um, not that it's a replacement, but I think it could augment those conversations in the future. And that's what we showed in that trial. Again, it's, it's preliminary. Um, I think the biggest thing, one of the biggest things we showed is not only is this data useful, that people that fit these categories, you know, older adults, people with um, a clinical diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease or mild cognitive impairment can actually use these tools and provide this data in their everyday life. 
And in that study enrolled over 100 individuals. You had people with uh, controls, you had people with mild cognitive impairment, and you had people with early Alzheimer's disease. That's, that's correct. So across the spectrum, and we were able to, to show that, you know, even with this very early stage work, that there is, um, there is evidence that we can actually classify people correctly. Um, you know, obviously not with 100% accuracy, we're not, we're not quite there yet, um, but uh, we're showing again that the pathway of potentially using these tools to do that classification um, work. So last week we had Dr. Peter Bergathon on who essentially heads digital medicine for Biogen, obviously has a huge interest in developing drugs for Alzheimer's disease. We know the Alzheimer's disease field is littered with failures. Uh, mm -hmm. Clinical trials is 99%. If you want to fail, you know how to do so. We have a well-established path. We have great outcome measures that can almost guarantee that you're going to fail. Uh, are we going to see some of these digital outcome measures being used in Alzheimer's disease trials in the future? I think so. Uh, I think in the next few years, you'll see these type of measures become more apparent. Uh, there's a variety of, of organizations and companies working on specific pieces of just, you know, like voice, for instance, or, or gait, or um, there's, a, there's a group in, in the UK called Cambridge Cognition. Like all they do is, is cognitive assessments using digital tools. I think what we're trying to do is how can you bring all of those together to have a more encompassing overarching view of what's going on um, from, you know, a mild cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease perspective. And, you know, you're right, a lot of these things fail. We may not be 100% perfect. Um, it's not gonna be replacing what is currently being used, but I, to go back to what I said previously, I, th I think that we do have the potential to augment and improve the conversations that are going on. Um, you mentioned the FDA and their, their guidance on real world evidence. One of the things that we're seeing, and I think if, if you read the FDA guidance when, when looking at um, clinical outcome assessments, that they're really taking the patient voice into um, consideration when people are designing new and novel endpoints. And I, I think that's where these digital measures actually have a key role to play is evaluating people about the things that they actually care about in their everyday life. Um, someone that goes in to see a neurologist may not care about every single item on one of those interviews or one of those assessments, but they really care about not being able to remember someone's name or feeling like they, they don't know um, how to navigate their neighborhood anymore. And I think that's where these digital tools can actually be really useful because we can map those signals that the tools provide directly to the symptoms that people actually care about in their everyday life. I think people really don't realize how subjective the current scales are. I mean, literally one of the scales asks for orientation, the person's oriented to time, oriented to time, most of the time, oriented to time, uh, a little bit of the time and has me fill out a box that goes from zero to 0 0.5 to one mm -hmm. a historical measure to address a disease that has manifestations that are continuous and in multiple different domains that we're completely missing. Five and a half million Americans have Alzheimer's disease and we have no highly effective treatments for it. There are very, very few conditions where you can think of that's the case. Yeah, I, I think there's... There's a lot of potential here. I, you know, we're, we're really proud to work in the space um, and, and proud to share you know, our results. And I think we're gonna hopefully be doing more work in the space in the near future to, to really kind of bring about, you know, help bring the, the field forward to use these digital measures appropriately. So COVID is another disease that has no highly effective treatments as we uh, sit here at today on April 7th, 2020. Uh, you guys in, uh, did a study through your achievement app, I believe, your achievement mm -hmm. That's four, nearly 4 million people who use it, including, as I found out a couple of days ago, Abby Arkey, our host, uh, one of your uh, participants in your research studies. And you got data from uh, participants in 94% of counties in the United States. I know you have some great data that you want to show and uh, show everyone. Uh, can you tell us what you found? So you mentioned, you know, we have um, 94, representation from 94% of, of all U.S. counties. And what... What we basically did is we saw that in you know, early March that there, there was a change coming. People were coming under stay-at-home orders. There was a, a huge um, surge in Seattle where we, we have a few of our employees. And 
you know, a couple of individuals within the company made the really smart suggestion and said, let's just use achievement to ask what's going on. Uh, we have the honor and kind of the, the greatness of having this, this app of 4 million people that are engaged with research that want to answer questions that, that trust us to do the right thing with their data because we're transparent and we, we think about consent first, we think about privacy um, all the time. And so we just threw out a survey and said, hey, to everybody, how are you feeling? What's going on? Have you, you know, have you been diagnosed? Do you know of anyone that's been diagnosed? What are your thoughts, perceptions, and behaviors related to the current pandemic? And that, that survey has been iterated on when we keep doing it every week. We add a few items, we remove a few items. And what we're seeing is that, A, people are highly engaged on this topic. Um, that should be no surprise. It's, it's affecting everyone's life but that we're, we're able to show that people's actual, the way they're thinking and way they're behaving is, is changing and it's changing quite rapidly. Um, you mentioned uh, consent. Uh, do people actually give consent uh, on, as research, consent to do research as part of the application and is this study reviewed by the, an IRB? That, that's a, um, a great point. Uh, this, this study is not currently under IRB review, but although we're talking to an IRB about the about using this data for potential um, generalizable knowledge and you know publication uh, what we typically do is provide a very thorough um, disclosure at the top of every single survey that says this is what we're doing this is uh, what we're going to ask about this is the type of data we're going to collect and this is how we're going to use it and it's about uh, about 150 200 words it's very clear um, and you have to to consent, you have to say, I'm willing to participate. And I agree to that disclosure in order to go through the actual survey. And um, as I mentioned, we're doing the survey every single week. Uh, so if you fill out the first survey, it has some demographic information, includes you know about 20 items or so about your thoughts, feelings, perceptions, behaviors. And then seven days later, you're gonna get the next survey, the next newest survey that we've done. That disclosure is again populated at the front of that survey. So we, we ask every single time so that you make sure that you have, you're making an informed choice about the data and the information that you're providing. Can you show us some results, especially on activity? Yeah, sure. So um, you know, with achievement, people can connect their devices and their applications that are measuring different aspects of their health. And we were able to show um, kind of interestingly against almost all anecdotal evidence, which people are like, oh my gosh, you know, so many people out on the sidewalk, so many people out in my neighborhood, that physical activity is falling and it's falling quite rapidly um, for every single state and the, the District of Columbia in the United States. And so when we look at individual people and we aggregate up their individual behavior to the state level, we're seeing um, the last time that we did this, which was at the end, very end of March, that almost a 40% decline in the last half of March in terms of physical activity. I know we're going to get questions on this. Uh, you're getting data. This activity is coming from various different wearable devices, mm -hmm. uh, Garmin, Fitbit, uh, others. Data suggests that these devices vary by, I think, about 20% when they measure activity. One, so one device could say it's steps or 80, and another one could say it's 100 steps. Uh, how do you reconcile this? And can you tell, tell us a little bit about that? This is, uh, I think the underlying question is something that we hear a lot, which is how can we trust these tools? Or can we trust these tools for research purposes, for clinical purposes? And uh, that it's, a, it's a really hard question. The, the nice thing is, is there's an entire field of research that is dedicated to this, um, typically done by, by the, the fine folks in public health settings or in kinesiology or exercise science departments to look at validation and verification of the devices. Um, from our perspective, for this particular research, one thing you'll notice here on our visualization is we're not using total numbers of steps. We're looking at individual change over time, aggregate, then aggregated by state. And so as long as these devices aren't just randomly wrong all the time, um, that type of error is, is accounted for because as long as you know, if your Garmin is off 500 steps, but it's off 500 steps just about every single day, that's fine because we're comparing you to yourself over time. You obviously do a lot of uh, work with a lot of different wearable devices. Do you have one that you recommend for maybe research colleagues who are thinking about using uh, a wearable device in research studies? Uh, I, I will give you 
the, my best answer, which is it depends. So um, when, when we do this work of figuring out what tools to use, we go through a process that we typically call our, our symptom signal sensor mapping process. And what that does is it says like, what are the symptoms you care about? What are the physiological behavioral signals that map to those symptoms? And then what are the sensors and tools that can actually capture that signal appropriately, effectively, and accurately? Um, and so it, it is, it, rather than saying, yes, go out and buy an Apple Watch or go out and buy a Garmin Vivo Fit 4 or go buy a, a Fitbit you know, Versa, it, it really is a fit for purpose question. It depends on what you wanna do. An Apple Watch currently doesn't measure sleep. A Fitbit does. Uh, Fitbit doesn't uh, show you heart rate variability right now, but an Apple Watch does. So it really depends on what you want to actually measure and what's important to your objectives for the study. How about if I push you and I say I'm planning a study that's looking to measure activity? What would you What would you recommend? I think I would recommend at the moment uh, the Fitbit family of devices or the garments. Um, both, both are good. They have different characteristics. The nice thing about those is that they have multi-day battery life um, and they are low cost and uh, they're cross-platform. So if you said, I want a thousand people across various socio-demographic characteristics, like I want a true representation of the United States, being able to have a device that can be used on both iOS and Android is really important. Something that, and also something that people kind of recognize, maybe their friends or family have it or a coworker has it. So it won't have the stigma of something that's you know, big and bulky or like a medical grade device. Um, I know you have some other results uh, from the study related to activity and also related to the sleep. You wanna share those with us? Sure, so you know, we, we saw um, activity changing, like I was saying, drastically over time. Um, we had 10% you know, drop uh, as of March 24th, you know, up to almost 40% by the end of March. Um, we also were looking at very specific regions and seeing how stay at home orders and, and directives uh, might have impacted activity. And you can definitely see here when we, we look at the difference between Santa Clara in yellow and New Orleans in um, this kind of uh, the orange reddish color here is that once you actually have those stay at home orders, they, there definitely is an impact on activity. And potentially, you know, with, when you do see impacts on activity, it could be effective as a way of mitigating um, the spread, the community spread of things like COVID-19, these infectious, new novel infectious diseases. Um, in terms of sleep, uh, I think this is the thing that m surprised most people um, because there's a lot of people like, and I think in our circles, like I'm working so much more right now or my life is disrupted. I, I feel like I'm getting less sleep, um, but it's, it's really helpful not to confuse personal anecdote with kind of population level data. And what we see is that the, the move from, you know, commuting to work, going up and going to the office five days a week or however many days you do work, um, and to staying at home and now working remotely is having a pretty drastic impact in, in that there is, you know, most states has increased, their sleep time has increased by almost 20%. Um, Mine hasn't, but <laughs> Apparently, most other, other people's have. <laughs> so these data are interesting. Uh, they're informative. Uh, what are their implications? I, I think the, there's a few implications. Um, one uh, is that people are interested and are, are kind of really just grasping to, be, to help here in some way. I think that what we saw in terms of the, the really quick uptake of this survey um, and the response rates that we're seeing week over week, you know, we have now over 200,000 people in the, the survey pipeline. We had over, over 100,000 people take the second survey. We're at about 95,000 that have taken the third survey and, and we're launching the fourth week this, um, today, this morning. Um, people want to participate. They want to tell someone else what's going on and what's happening in their lives. Um, the second piece of this I think that is really interesting is that we can start to maybe look at how these really drastic societal changes that come from, you know, uh, you know, from in this case, you know, government mandates are impacting health and behavior. Uh, and that, that's, a, it's, it's almost like it's a really interesting natural experiment that's going on. Like what happens if you just took away commuting from a lot of the country, what would actually occur? You know, I think what we're seeing is that, you know, people 
they, they can't go to their gym. And there's a lot of just incidental activity that occurs within the workplace that is now just gone. So it's a lot different uh, than, you know, walking around my apartment than I was like walking around the office now. And that, you know, we have that reduction in activity. And I think the other thing that we're seeing is that there's a lot, huge interest to make this type of objective data useful um, for these type of infectious disease and pandemics. And that's something we're really interested in. We've got uh, quite a few projects around influenza that are currently ongoing that we're hoping to leverage that type of work for uh, COVID-19 very soon. We'll get to influenza in a moment. Uh, researcher want to know, are these data generalizable? Uh, a priori, one would think that you might have a select population, maybe higher education, higher socioeconomic status that are participating in these studies. Is that true? Uh, it depends on the study. You know, with, with a large uh, cohort that we have at, at 4 million people, we have the ability to create specific cohorts to do this type of work. So if someone is, is specifically interested in uh, a representative population of the United States, that we can actually pull and, and do that targeting and that enrollment in that way. For studies like this, where it was kind of come one, come all, we're um, at the nature of like who wants to actually participate without any kind of gating or inclusion exclusion criteria. Uh, what we see is, you know, primarily uh, younger adults, so, you know, over 30 or so um, are participating in here. Uh, we have a skew a little bit more female, um, but right now one of the things that we're actively working on is applying some new rating strategies in order to get to that generalizable information, those estimates in the future. How about participation of minorities, individuals from lower socioeconomic groups? Uh, yeah, we have we have quite a few uh, in in the cohort here that's participated in our COVID pulse, which is what we call this um, behaviors and attitudes and perceptions survey. Um, and then we we see that those represent those individuals are tend to actually be represented pretty well in our digital trials, um, mostly because it's it's a way for people to actively engage in research that typically aren't you know they're not looking at clinicaltrials.gov, they're not part of an academic research center or, you know, on a university setting where they're going to get exposed to the type of recruitment that's typical. And then who sponsors these studies? Do you have research partners? Who's, who's funding the good work that you guys are doing? Yeah, that's a great question. So our, our projects are supported, or our programs are supported by a variety of partners that span biopharmaceutical, healthcare systems, uh, academic and university research centers, as well as government funded projects. And so it really depends on who's interested in, in what type of work. In some cases, we go out to people we think we know how to do something um, such as our, our influenza work that's funded by BARDA. We had an idea based off of some of our internal studies that we thought would be really useful. We, we went to the government and said, um, you know, through obviously an RFP, pr put a grant proposal in, um, which was accepted and, and then that was done. Uh, in other cases like Apple and Eli Lilly, they have an interesting idea. They think that, that something's, uh, something is, is available in terms of a digital measure. They wanted to explore that in an innovative way, and they needed a technology partner that could understand both, or kind of the, the full swath of both how to integrate technology into a study, how to actually do the participant and, and patient engagement to keep people enrolled, and then how to actually analyze that data once it's collected. And that's, that's what we do. We do that full kind of pipeline of, of clinical research. Do you have any external funding for the COVID-19 Pulse study? As of right now, we don't. Uh, we're looking at, you know, potential partners to, to work on a, a new study that we're launching here very soon, um, which is going to be a, a daily symptoms and experiences study. Uh, that should be going out very, very, <laughs> launching very, very soon. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to uh, bring some partners on. At the moment, we're actually going to be uh, hoping to Put that data out into the public sphere for qualified researchers and institutions that can actually you know do something with it if you're a public health agency or you're a university get in touch with me i'm, I'm very easy to find it's just e ramirez at evidation.com um and and we can talk about that and but obviously we're looking for partners on that as well just to see if we can boost that enrollment get people involved um it's it's really important i have a public health background so I'm always going to say that it's really important for people to be engaged in research, especially at this time uh, when we don't know what we don't know yet. Um, and there's a lot of kind of intrigue and anecdotes and, and unknowns and uncertainty about what's happening, and what's going to happen over the next few months. Are these data going to tell us when the pandemic has passed or at least the peak? Uh, I don't think these data 
but I think this type of data, the daily symptom um, surveillance type of work that we are looking to do um, could be a really nice adjunct to the case and case reports that are coming through clinical testing. I think it's no surprise we, we're starting to know that clinical testing is only telling us a small part of the story, specifically because testing has been very hard to come by at the moment. And so having uh, people start to report their symptoms uh, a little bit more clearly and have that, having that data available to people that can actually you know, work with it, you know, county level, state level, and university level epidemiologists and biostatisticians, I think would have the potential to tell us when, when things might have peaked or when we might have flattened the curve, so to speak. We're gonna open up for uh, questions in just a second here. Uh, before we do, uh, what projects do you have in the pipeline? You mentioned influenza. Yeah, so we have a few projects in influenza. Um, one that I specifically wanna just talk briefly about is our uh, funded study through BARDA, uh, which we're doing with a, a nonprofit partner in the Seattle area as well. And that is a, a really novel study of doing daily symptom reporting and at-home diagnostic testing. And so we have about 5,300 individuals that are currently in the study who are doing a daily symptom report, telling us whether or not they feel any symptoms. If they feel certain types of symptoms, they trigger uh, a um, information and instructions on how to actually take their flu kit. They've, they already have it at their house. We ship it to them. Um, it's, they do a, a mid-turbinate nasal swab, so not the, if you're familiar with the nasal swabs and all the testing that's been going on, there's a nasal pharyngeal, which is somewhat uncomfortable, all the way back into the, the very back of the nasal cavity. Um, mid-turbinate's just up in the nose a little bit, uh, putting that in, in the solution, sending that back to the lab, and then we get the diagnostic tests. Um, that's combined with actual wearable activity tracker data. And so what we're looking to do is figure out, uh, can we tell, um, can we classify and can we understand flu days versus non-flu days right now? And working with our partners, seeing if there's actually ways to do, to leverage other types of diagnostic testing, maybe like rapid diagnostic testing to, to better inform uh, not only surveillance, but potential you know, forecasting in the future. Uh, you mentioned BARDA for our listeners. Uh, can you tell us who, who BARDA is or what BARDA is? Yeah, the uh, I always say I, I can get their their acronym. I get always confused, um, but the I always uh, say they're the DARPA for NIH. <laughs> so if you're familiar, like DARPA, like they're the people that go out and do the moonshots and create those crazy robots. Um, NIH, you know, Health and Human Services, they need the same thing. Um, it's the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority. And we're, we're funded under a project that's specifically around uh, syndromic surveillance and pandemic and infectious disease response. Outstanding. I think we can stop sharing the screen now. Maybe we'll sure. turn it over to Abby. He's got some uh, questions, I'm sure, with many, from many of our listeners. Definitely. So we've had a few questions come in. And if anyone else has a question they'd like to ask, feel free to type it using the Q&A button below. Um, the first question is, what variable would you most like to measure or a question you'd like to ask that you're not currently in your COVID research? Hmm, question that I would, or something that I would like to measure. Um, oh gosh, just one? It's so hard to pick just one. I think, honestly, I think heart rate variability would be very, very interesting. Um, there's a lot of, of really good research out there over the last five years, um, almost last decade now, that has shown that heart rate variability to be a, a really good leading indicator of, um, uh, of infectious disease symptoms and just general, you know, malaise and, and issues um, around the immune system and the immune system response. So I think that would be really, really interesting um, to include that as a kind of a key leading indicator. Does heart rate variability decrease with infections or increase with infections? It's, it's one of those weird things that uh, decreases. So more variability is better from a heart rate variability perspective. Less variability is worse. So we see the same thing in, in Parkinson's disease and other neurodegenerative disorders. You see a decrease in heart rate variability. You know, previously never really been able to measure that except with episodic ECGs, uh, mm -hmm. and now you do it in almost a continuous way. I know the the Apple Watch has HR, uh, HRV. They they do the RMSSD. Um, you know, we 
a friend of mine uh, that's based in the EU has uh, an app that a lot of you know sports and athletes use called HRV for training. Uh, they, there, I think we're going to see HRV be more and more useful and more and more used, um, both just within like the clinical testing, but also just the research environment as it becomes something that is continuous and uh, more easily uh, or more readily available. Abby. Great. So the next question, I believe, goes back um, to one of the earlier studies you've referenced. It asks, are you seeing unexpected indicators on wearables? For example, do you see people starting to limit their movements before they even realize their cognition is failing? So for your AD study. Hmm. Uh, that's a great question. Um, we're, we're not seeing that yet because the, the space, the, the, frequency of the actual cognitive measurement. So the actual like clinical interviews, those are still episodic in nature. So we are still just trying to figure out like how much can we understand about actual like self-reported cognition and a clinical assessment in combination with these digital measures. Um, I think we did see just as kind of um, some insight, uh, one that the paper that we wrote that was at the KDD conference or presented at the KDD conference is, is readily available on our website. Um, it's open source. Uh, or open access, sorry. Uh, we did see that there were some indicators from mobile phone use that seemed to be really interesting. Um, we, we're not really to say exactly, you know, put the headline out there that says how you use your mobile phone is directly related, but it does seem that how people use their mobile phone and their interactions with their phone um, could be quite useful. So there's research from other studies that demonstrate that people uh, with Alzheimer's disease have early declines in their gait speed, so declines in speed precede the uh, development of cognitive impairment. We're doing studies in Parkinson's disease that are going to start to evaluate in Huntington's disease, evaluate people who are at high genetic risk for these disorders because they carry APOE4 for uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease or LARP2 for Parkinson's disease. It's, it's really interesting. I think uh, mo movement in general, you know, I think we, we've really focused in clinical research on just general movement, you know, maybe a six minute walk test, but just general steps per day or the amount of moderate to vigorous, vigorous physical activity, because all of that came from a, a very like a health and wellness aspect or overall, just overall mortality. Um, gait I, I, is, I think something is really, really interesting. It's going to be probably impactful if it can be measured effectively and easily um, it, now and into the future across a variety of therapeutic areas. The hard part with gait at the moment is that it still requires um, some pretty robust clinical grade sensing devices, uh, but I think we'll be moving to, to using more consumer tools um, as the raw sensor data and another gait characteristics are, are kind of built in. You start to think about drugs aimed at preventing Alzheimer's disease, for example, you're going to need these, digi these digital tools and these novel measures because our existing measures are hopelessly uh, not well, they're not even designed to assess people in the prodromal period. Exactly, and you, you need to be able to assess them for long periods of time because there's a difference between I sprain my ankle and my gait's a little wishy-washy or it's not really the best, and you know yet you have a, a definitive change in gait, and that change is actually longitudinal. It's a, it's actually continuing to happen, or it's changed drastically, and then now is in a, more, a worse state than it was previously. So being able to measure people, you know, across the lifespan or across a long period of time can give us those insights. Abby? How are your findings being used to inform policy? For example, do you foresee your tracking data being helpful as we start to relax social distancing measures? Uh, that's a great question. I, I would love to have those conversations um, and and talk to people that are making the policies and or you know enforcing the policies at the moment. Um, I can say that you know I mentioned we're putting in place our our fourth weekly survey for COVID Pulse, and there's a few items in there that are specifically geared towards assessing what do people think they know about um, you know reducing their risk of of contracting coronavirus or COVID-19, and uh, if social distancing and or stay-at-home orders, whatever's in place where you live, were lifted, what would you do? What are the actions that you would take? Um, those type of things, uh, I think, could be really impactful in the future. 
Um, we're also asking about um, at-home testing, right, which is, is new for this week around. And I think uh, as a stroke of luck and just in general, like for I think partially because we stay so on top of what's going on, you know, CDC on Saturday, I think it was Saturday or maybe late Friday, said that they're going to start to um, use antibody testing for COVID-19 um, to understand who might have been exposed, um, whether it is specifically with, for people that were asymptomatic, and to see whether or not, you know, they actually are immune over time. We, we asked explicitly about, you know, would people want to do that and would they be willing to do kind of antibody testing? Would they be willing to do at-home nasal swabs if available? Um, I think that type of information uh, could be really use useful for these public, large scale, you know, state, local, even the national public health agencies as they think through what should we be talking about and how should we be working with the general public. You know, that testing is going to be critical to ending uh, this pandemic and telling us when it's safe to resume at least some modicum of a normal life and be extremely valuable. Mm -hmm. Abby Moore. Have you done any studies to verify the parameters computed from wearable devices? To verify the parameters, I'm assuming that the question here is really around um, validation. So when someone wears an Apple Watch or a Fitbit um, and they go for a walk, that those, the steps that they count or the amount of, uh, the in, the amount of act activity that they do, whether it's moderate or vigorous, kind of that classification is, is accurate and useful. Uh, we do engage in, in uh, some of that work uh, internally at Evidation, but we also rely uh, really heavily um, on the, the general research field that we are constantly looking uh, for and scouring research. I have, I think now, seven PubMed alerts and I think 10 Google Scholar alerts with a variety of, of different search terms um, in some combination of activity tracker, wearable device, heart rate, activity, you know, to see you know, what's actually being done and what's out there. And I, I will say that, that this is a constant state of research catching up. Um, and it's, it's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm so excited to be in industry is that, that we can do this work and we can typically do it a little bit faster, um, that we can work on, on the validation piece and still adhere to rigorous scientific and research methodologies. Um, I think when you see a research study come out, let's say for a Fitbit device saying this, the heart rate uh, for a device during sleep is valid and accurate for this type of individual or someone with, with this diagnosis. Uh, that article typically is available about two years after that device came out and potentially is no longer even available and you can't buy it anymore. Um, and so we, this is a problem, right? Research is always trying to catch up with that, that speed of commercial innovation that's happening. And that, that's where I think we need to really think through, and I think the FDA is actually thinking through, how can they actually enable people to work with commercial devices? Um, and so that's part of like the pre-certification program, if, if you all are familiar with it, um, that they're working with, you know, I think Apple, Fitbit, um, a nonprofit called Tidepool that works in the type one diabetes space. They're all part of that pre-certification process to see, you know, what could the FDA do to make it so that you don't have to look at every single device or every single algorithm? Can you certify uh, a process? Can you certify, you know, um, the company and what they do so that, that you can have trust and accountability for what they're, what they're actually putting out into the world? I'll give a plug here for our journal, Digital Biomarkers, which I had the fortunate to edit, and we're pleased to be publishing one of your papers uh, coming out. We try, we have tried very quick turnaround time. Sometimes we do 30 days for a uh, peer review. Uh, it's open access, and right now there's no article processing charges. Again, the journal's name is Digital Biomarkers. We'd love uh, studies from Evidation and from many of our listeners. Abby, maybe one more question, then we'll ask Ernesto for some final thoughts. Definitely. So one question um, asks about engaging consumers. So what types of materials have you either distributed in the past um, or plan to implement with this COVID research so that consumers see the value in sharing their information? Uh, great. That, that's a great question. So we are I guess I'll start and say like I 
don't think of people as consumers. <laughs> I, I, you know, in a, for achievement, we think of them as members. They have to actively engage and they have to sign up. Um, we, we actually are, are very hesitant to do a lot of proactive outreach because we don't want to be the, the bothersome people that are asking you all the time to do something. Um, we want to be there when you're ready to engage and you're, you're ready to be a participant. Um, I, I tend to think of, uh, I like to think of people as participants. It gives them some agency. It gives them, you know, that sense of autonomy. Uh, one of the things that we do is we are trying to quit as quickly as possible and as, as fast as our an analysts and our engineers can, can work together to, to actually generate results like what I showed earlier, we share that directly back to everyone within our system. We actually, you know, in the app, there's these things that we call offers, little tiles that I say, like, hey, do this study, or would you like to do this study? Would you like to participate in this survey research? Um, part of that is also just, hey, here's what we're finding out right now with, with our COVID-19 survey. Go read this article where you can look at exactly what's going on, what our findings were. Um, and we're, we're actually working on how to do that even better within the context of the studies that we do so that when someone's involved in the study, they don't just you know, fill out surveys for a few months and, and maybe you know, do a nose swab and then thank you, goodbye, here's your, you know, here's your incentive. It's here's what we ha learned, here's what we learned about you know, this particular um, area of interest, here's the study or here's the publications that we found or here's some other interesting things that you contributed to um, as a way of not only saying thank you but of engaging people in the actual full process. I think a lot of times research really um, only engages participants when it's useful for them. At the very beginning, when you want to enroll someone, and then when you're actually doing data collection. And once you're done with data collection, they're gone. Um, I don't think that's, and I don't think evidation, we don't think that's the only way to do things. I, we think that, that, that if you develop that relationship that, again, centers on trust, transparency, and, and openness, um, you can involve people for a long period of time in a variety of different projects and programs. And maybe instead of getting rid of customers, we can also get rid of subjects. That'd be a nice way to get rid of uh, all together. Uh, I would, I, I, I truly dream one day I won't have to hear it anymore. Uh, Ernesto, Evan's uh, tagline is radically changing medicine. What radical changes do you foresee? I, I think the, one of the biggest changes is exactly what we were just talking about, is bringing people and patients and participants to the forefront of the conversation when it comes to your research. Um, I think too often in the past and, and even today, we make the mistake of going directly to clinicians and researchers and saying, what's important to you? How can I figure out the thing? Um, can I make a better six minute walk test for you? And what we don't do, um, well enough, and I think what, we're, what people are starting to do is engage actual people, the people that are you know, boots on the ground, that are taking these medications, that are having to navigate you know, a variety of different clinical appointments um, and their home life you know, with Alzheimer's disease, with Parkinson's, asking them, what matters to you? How can I do something that's going to reflect what's really going on in your life? And then taking that information, designing research studies, clinical assessments, digital endpoints, and then, and then hopefully, you know, at, at the end of the day, you know, we won't do it, but someone will develop the therapeutics that'll actually have an impact on the things that matter to them. Um, that, yeah, that, that, that's, uh, I think, where we think we're radical, is we're, we're trying to bring that patient voice, that, that patient experience and participant experience to bear on these outcomes, um, on, on medicine in, in general. So maybe we can start bringing research studies to participants instead of participants to research studies. And maybe we can start bringing clinical trials to participants, direct consumer, direct to participant clinical trials, instead of relying on people to go to sites to participate in clinical trials. We do a lot of that work at the Center for Health and Technology. I know that's your uh, entire motto, uh, mode, of, uh, mode of conducting research at Evidation. Hopefully we can do that uh, both during and uh, after the pandemic. Ernesto, thank you very much for joining us on Chat Talks and for sharing your pioneering research on COVID and a wide range of other conditions. Our next Chat Talk is Thursday, April 9th at noon Eastern time. When we'll be speaking to Dr. Dina Katabi, a professor of electrical engineering at MIT. She's also a MacArthur Genius Award winner. 
She's created an entirely passive radio wave device that measures activity and behavior in the home. It might be the coolest thing that I have uh, seen in this entire space. I know Ernesto has probably seen this uh, as well. Be cool. Mind blowing. <laughs> Mind blowing, according to Dr. Ernesto Ramirez. Uh, until then, the Center for Health and Technology at the University of Rochester, thanks you for joining us. Have a great Thank day. Thank you so much. Have a good one.